and close it. Uh, um, this is our second uh, historical talk, and the first one was a month ago, and we had about 30 people that, that came uh, to that one. And, but the unbelievable thing is, we've had, it's on our uh, Facebook page, and there's, oh, we have over 600 people that have watched it on Facebook. So it doesn't matter that we have some empty chairs because it'll be out there for other people to watch. And um, there was two things I was going to mention. Wonder what they were. The upcoming Greater Road Day. Oh, I am going to talk about uh, yeah, trails and trains. That's not day after tomorrow, but the, the first the, Saturday, the, like a week from Saturday. It's going to be here in town. You could be thinking they're um, they're looking for some volunteers. If anybody's interested, I've got a little sign-up sheet um, if you'd like to be a volunteer for that. And um, I was going to tell you afterwards some of the different things that we have on tap or we're thinking about as far as other historical talks. I think in June it's probably going to work Unofficially, it's the Albert Joyner family is going to come and talk, and then in July, we're calling it our town, and maybe like the fire department, we've talked to the fire department, we've talked to the Masons, and maybe some other groups will come just to tell the history of like, like their group. Uh, so I think that would be very neat, and then probably in October, we'll do. Uh, We'll do our own version of uh, trains, like trains, depot trains, the mountain railroad, the geyser, and all of that. So, um, but if you have any ideas, um, I've got some note cards. When you when you leave, um, write them down on the note card and just leave them with us. Or on Facebook, you can put up any ideas that you have that you'd like for us to try to pull together a story. So I thank you for coming, and uh, Terry's going to share with us some um, uh, history of Old Fort School. And then uh, after his portion of the program, we'll take a little break, and then that will give us an opportunity to maybe tell a story or two or a memory or two of when we were in school. Terry, okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Actually, I'm wearing two hats tonight. I told Kathy that I wanted to do two things tonight. And uh, the first one, I'll uh, mention that quickly and get that out of the way. You see here in front of me is the Friends of the Mountain Gateway Museum. We are conducting a membership drive at the museum right now. It seems like every time there is a uh, how do I say it? Every time there's some dissension in Raleigh, they start looking at places to prune the budget. And one of the places that always gets a strong look is the Department of Natural and Human Resources, Dina. And we always get the look. And when they look at the museums, one thing they look at is what type of local support do you have, i.e., what type of membership do you have in a friend's association? And we have a fairly good number on paper, but we would like to convert that number to an even higher number so we can tell the folks in Raleigh that our museum is growing. We serve all of Western North Carolina. We are the westernmost Dean Museum in North Carolina. And we serve everything from McDowell County to the Tennessee border, which encompasses quite a bit of territory. And we, we would like to increase our membership and possibly show the folks in Raleigh, hey, we're a small museum, we're in a building that was never meant to be a museum, but we're growing and we're serving 
more and more and more people. So that's what I've got here. I would like for everyone, to, when you leave tonight, to take one of these with you and just look at it at your leisure. We're not asking for countless hours of labor or anything like that. We meet four times a year. And our main job right now is to advise the museum on what we think would be a good project for Old Ford or what we think might be a good project for Western North Carolina. And if you have not been down to the museum to see the most recent exhibit on the town of Old Fort, please go. Please go and look at what Miss Bishop and her staff have done. They have created a fantastic exhibit down there. And this is a halfway exhibit. She has so many artifacts that people have loaned that she's going to have to take this one down in the late fall and put up the second half of the exhibit. So we're all excited about that. We have basically a wealth of artifacts that we want to share with the people here in Old Ford and those that come in. So if you haven't been, please go, go and take a look. Uh, uh, I'm an old social studies teacher, history teacher. And I just, first time I saw that, I just freaked out. I said, hey, this is fantastic. This, this is what Old Fort needs. And it is a fantastic exhibit. They put together just one of the best museum exhibits that I've ever seen. So yeah, we're a small town, a small museum, but we have got a class A exhibit down there. So if you have a chance, please stop by and see it. Uh, if you're the fire department company, well, that's the EMS. All right, so I'll go ahead and start tonight. And you went the other way. I would like to thank you for coming tonight. Before I begin, I want to thank a couple of folks for their efforts in the past years of putting together a history of Old Fort and the Old Fort community, which I borrowed from to put this presentation together. I'd like to thank Ms. Mildred Fawcett, Ms. Betty Marston, and Ms. Doris Cordell. None of them are with us now, but a large portion of their life was devoted to McDowell County and collecting history of the county in the form of interviews, pictures, essays. They put together one of the best local histories that I've ever seen. And that's what I have used in many times to develop my report here tonight to you or that I've done in the past. I heard it said one time that the most often discussed parts of life in a small town were those which involved the local churches or the local schools. One of the two. If you saw three people standing together talking, chances were they were talking about the schools or the churches. And I think that's probably true. I'm sure that everyone here tonight has memories of old Fort schools, memories that they hold near and dear to their heart. I know I do. I was fortunate enough to go all the way through old Fort school. I can remember Miss Lola Lunnan and her eighth grade poems. Paul Revere's ride, Ode to a Waterfowl, the Landing of the Pilgrim Fathers. I remember those poems. I would hate to try and say them now, but I remember her having us say them. I remember Miss Beulah Nichols, who opened up the world to first graders through the adventures of Dick, Sally, and Jane, the dog Spot, and that big old yellow cat. I think its name was Fluff. Uh, can anyone forget Mr. Ken Griffin? leading his basketball team to another victory 
over Coleman Wright and the boys from down at PG. And more importantly, can anyone remember who run the fight at the Burger Boy afterwards? Seems like there was always a fight after Old Fort and PG playing ball. And one thing I remember, Old Fort's football team made national history one night. They recovered three onside kicks in a row in a driving rainstorm at Polk Central and lost the game by 20 points. <laughs> to examine the history of Old Fort, it's necessary to step back in time, which I've said before. You've got to step back to the first settlers who came to this area. They were a blend of Scotch-Irish, Lowland British, and Rhineland Germans. These were subsistence farmers who worked their land as their parents and grandparents had done before them. To them, an education wasn't a necessary part of their life, and many looked upon the days of schooling as just a day off the farm and out of the field. So education did not have a top priority among the first settlers. The first schools in the Old Ford area were local in every sense of the word. Schools were found in communities surrounding Old Fort, such as Curtis Creek, Ebenezer, Mount Heber, Cherry Springs, Catawba Falls. These areas saw local buildings, often churches, used for a small portion of the year as their schools. The schoolmistress many times was often a local teenage girl who had excelled in the same school. The schools were one room except for Cherry Springs, which my father and his sisters and brother attended for two years. That was a two-room school. One was called the Little Room and one was called the Big Room. The students were expected to learn by rote memorization. There were not a lot of books. There was no such thing as homework or anything like that. The boys were expected to learn enough reading and writing, enough math, so that they could function in the marketplace. The girls were expected to learn to read so that they could function and read the Bible to their children. This often led to just plain memorization. The first school in the town of Old Fort was a one-room subscription school which opened in 1885 on property near where the First Baptist Church sits today. The citizens of the town were responsible for both the funding and the day-to-day -day management of the school. As with other mountain schools, the curriculum was basic math and reading. Other subjects were looked upon as not necessary and indeed a waste of time and precious funds. But the turn of the century saw changes across our country. The Civil War and its memories were buried in the past. The United States had just defeated Spain in the War of 1898. The factory system developed by Henry Ford was quickly becoming a way of life in American cities and change was coming to Old Fort too. In 1904, Governor Charles Acock began his Good Schools program across North Carolina with the goal of ensuring that the citizens of North Carolina would be able to function in the coming years. Counties and schools, pardon me, counties and towns were encouraged to improve their schools any way they could. In Old Fort, the school on Thompson Street proved inadequate to meet the needs of the community. The town purchased land from Mr. Sidney Boney along what is now Moni Avenue. This is where they planned to build and did actually build their next school. This was actually Mr. Moni's cow pasture. And we have seen pictures of his cattle standing there grazing where the school buildings are today. But a three-room school was built on the property and the students were encouraged to attend with an idea of meeting the world head on. And I looked 
for this today and I found it on the internet. The teachers that were in the schools had so many responsibilities. Even today, teachers have a lot of responsibilities. But I wanted to find, I wanted to find this, I'd seen it before, and I found it this morning on the internet. Teacher requirements for the year 1900. Arrive at school one hour early to ensure a clean classroom and warm classrooms in the wintertime. Keep a bucket of coal and a bucket of water on hand at all times. Speak in a polite voice to all parents of all students. Refrain from wearing makeup in public and males should never be shaved in public. Refrain from singing loudly in church. Ladies were not to wear wide brim hats or brightly colored clothes. Ladies were not allowed to ride in carriages with males other than their relatives. And neither males nor females could be seen in after hours establishments that catered to eating and entertainment. So it was quite, quite a different time than what we see now. When the new school was built, Mr. N.F. Stepp was a teacher at the school. He was also the school's first principal. Teachers were expected to serve dual and sometimes triple roles. That's where the word principal comes from. It used to be a two word phrase, principal teacher. And then it has been shortened over the years just to principal. But Mr. Stepp was the first principal teacher at Old Fort School. He saw the high school grades nine, 10, and 11 added to the curriculum. And he also presided as the first graduating class of Old Fort School crossed the stage in the spring of 1917. But he left shortly thereafter to become the county superintendent of schools in McDowell County, a job that he held for many years. After Mr. Stepp left, Mr. George Strickland followed as principal and he served in the position until 1927. A fire damaged a large portion of the original three room school in 1923, the 100th anniversary. But the school was quickly repaired and it was again functioning by 1924. Mr. Strickland left Old Fort as principal in 1927 and was followed by Mr. A.D. Nolan. And Mr. Nolan was what we'd call the vanilla principal. Nothing went on while he was principal. He was smooth and everything was happy while he was going on. But the effects of the Great Depression were spreading across the country by the late 1920s. Many schools closed as their enrollments fell. In 1933, the state of North Carolina stepped up and took control of all public school systems in the state. This was viewed by some as a power grab, but cooler heads realized that the local units did not have the funds to continue in operation. So it was allowed to be a success. Also in 1933, the County School Board of McDowell County decided to consolidate the one room schools that are around the county and bring them into town. Bus transportation was introduced and the children from Mount Heber, Catawba Falls, Curtis Creek, Cherry Springs were now bused into Old Fort as part of their daily educational experience. And as a result of the increased enrollment, the three room school that had been rebuilt over here on Money Avenue, and I believe there's a picture of it here. Okay. Yep. The three room school was no longer effective. It was torn down in 1934 to make room for new students. With the help of the WPA and the CCCs, a new school was constructed and opened in 1937. Among the parts that a lot of folks, I'm sure a lot of it in this room will remember, 
was the old auditorium building. This building was designed to hold the high school students. And an interesting side story is that that building was constructed without the use of iron or steel due to the fact that in the late 1930s, a priority was being placed on iron and steel being used by the military. But when the building was torn down four years ago, an arch girder of steel was discovered over the top of the auditorium. So they did use some steel in there, not a lot, but some. After World War II, the school's enrollment continued to rise and between 1952 and 1954, 13 additional classrooms were added to the school campus. In 1958, a large multi-dimensional building was added to serve as the classroom and learning lab for the vocational agricultural program. The last construction before the demolitions occurred in 1962 with the addition of two classrooms attached to the side of the elementary school building. Even though they were attached to the side of the elementary building, they were for use by the high school. In 1955, our town and our school received national attention and notoriety from Look Magazine as Mr. Albert Joyner and five local students attempted to integrate Old Ford Elementary School. This was before Rosa Parks. It was before the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins. Mr. Joyner and the children were unsuccessful. It took 10 more years before the students were allowed to attend Old Ford School. The current school concept that we have now was established in 1972 when the countywide high schools were consolidated to create McDowell High School. And when we talk about Old Fort School, the principals come to mind again. After Mr. Nolan, we had Mr. S.A. McDuffie. He served as the first principal of the town school. His tenure as principal lasted until 1941, when Mr. Charles Norwood took over just before the outbreak of World War II. Mr. Norwood led the school through the years of World War II, and he died in 1945. His funeral service was held in the auditorium of the school. We have a custodian over here that used to swear that his ghost still haunted the school. Mr. Harry Spofford was the next principal, and during his time, the decision was made to extend the true schooling experience from 11 to 12 years. There was no graduating class in 1946. They graduated in 1947. The principal, that most of us here in the room remember was Mr. P.W. Greer. Mr. Greer served as principal during the 1950s and 60s. He was born in Todd, North Carolina, up in Ashe County. He attended Appalachian State University and NC State University with the idea of being an engineer. He did not plan to be an educator. But fate moved in other ways, and Mr. Greer ended up in the educational system. I remember Mr. Greer from the time I was in first grade. And I always wondered, what does the PW stand for? What does the PW stand for? And Mr. Greer wouldn't tell. He would not tell. He kept it a secret. Sometimes a word might leak out here or sometimes there. But I didn't know until I found his grave marker what the PW stood for. It was Plato Whittington. A fellow told me the other day, man, if that was my name, I wouldn't say it either. But that was what his name was, Plato Whittington. 
I can remember Mr. Greer walking the high school halls, walking the middle school halls with a paddle in his back pocket. And if he saw something he didn't like, he would correct the situation then and there. Right then, right there. Mr. Greer left in 1970 and was replaced by Mr. Wayne Silver. Mr. Silver was followed by David Ricketts. Then came Odell Parker, Paula Norton. After Miss Norton came Pat Faulkner. I forgot her name for a second. Pat Faulkner. After Miss Faulkner came Charles Gaffigan. After Charles came Greg Hughes. Lisa Dillingham unfortunately died while she was principal here. And now the principal is Miss Jill Ward. Our school has changed a lot as the world around it has changed. When I was teaching, parents would say, send the book home and I'll help. If you'll send the books home, I'll help. We don't have books to send home now. Everything is on the computer. The students over here amaze me. They carry Chromebooks, which are tablets. Everything that they possibly need is on that tablet for their grade. And then as they move forward in grade, it changes. It keeps going. It, it just totally amazes me. And I can't help but think back to my times here at Old Fort. And one thing I remember was a question that a lot of people heard at the beginning of the year. Where are you from? The answer to this question was one of two. It was either town or out in the country. If somebody wanted to be a little bit more specific, they might say down on the river. But that was it. Town, country, down on the river. Nowadays, as I think to my years as a teacher over here at Old Fort, I think of the same question. And I think of the answer that my students could give me at this day and time. I've had students from Russia, Albania, Syria, Turkey, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Canada, all in this small town. I think of my students who have traveled the world from Old Fort, and in my mind I can count ministers, college presidents, published authors, school principals, military leaders, and those who have remained here and made our community what it is today. Today, our school has an enrollment of 341 students. I checked today about three o'clock. Our school serves grades pre-K through fifth. Miss Jill Ward is the principal and she was born and raised up here about a mile from where we are right now in Allison Town, just above the road that turns to Camp Greer. I threaten her every now and then and tell her I'm going to show the principal or show the students her grades when she was in my class. And she told me if I ever do that, I'll never work again. So <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. But one thing that I remember and I've mentioned to several of the students at several different times, when I was in the eighth grade, Mr. Greer came to see me one and he wanted me to do him a favor. He wanted me to be the person who rang the second bell in the afternoon. The bell was not automatic. What he wanted me to do was to take a chair and go into the boys' restroom, step up to the window, and watch the buses as they came around the back corner of the gym. When bus 12 came around, we had 12 buses. When bus 12 came down, I got down out of the chair, walked into the office where Margie Thompson was sitting, reached up and pushed the button, 
and the second bell rang. Now each day, over there on what was Mr. Money's cow pasture, the bells still ring, the doors still open, and memories are made by our students for a new generation. But I want to close by pointing out a couple of things that our children will never do. Our children will never do these things. They will never use a dial telephone. They will never read a printed road map. They will never hear a typewriter bell. They will never watch a black and white television program or read the magazine TV guide. They will never watch Saturday morning cartoons and they will never crank up a car window unless they are in an antique at a car show. They will never rent a video. They will never look for a telephone number in the yellow pages. And this one really struck me here. They will never have a need for a set of encyclopedias. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, thank you. So we were going to take just a little break. I brought some water and some cookies that I'll put out. And then um, uh, we'll let anybody that wants to um, share a couple of stories of, uh, or anything they'd like to share from their school days. How's that? So let me get the water and the cookies. Yeah, it's kind of warm. Right. It's kind of warm in this place. Oh, my scissors are in here. 